Hi everyone and welcome to today's Chrissy B Show. So we have a very varied show for you today covering different topics all to help you with you and your loved ones because after all we are the UK's only TV show dedicated to mental health and well-being. Now decluttering is great for us and we continue with our Sal Sorts It series where our declutter expert Sally Warford shows us how to sort and organise the different rooms in our house and this time it's a living room. We then go to our psychologist Dr Audrey Tang with tips on how to help someone who's depressed. We have our workout of the week with fitness expert Natalia Katowska. Then we welcome back our autism news correspondent Anna Kennedy and her guests Dr Dagmara Dimitriou and Cos Michael to discuss autism and sleep. Nutritionist Severin Menem gives advice for diabetes and Dr Rob Hicks gives tips to help if you have tennis elbow. So let's get started with Sally Warford showing us how to declutter and organise a living room. Hi everybody, here we are again, ready to declutter Larissa's home. Last time we did Larissa's bedroom, it was fantastic. We transformed a cluttered space into a really relaxing and calm environment for her. Today, we're going to be doing the living room, stroke study, stroke cloak room. We've got lots going on, so I can't wait to get started. Oh, and there's Larissa now. Hiya, love. One sec. Great, let's go. Hi, love. Hello. Hello. How are you? Um, you good? Uh, yeah, I'm very excited. Good. I'm really excited to get going with the lounge. So we've got a lot to do though, so we'd better get going. Let's right. come in. Yes. So here we are. And I can already see that we talked about that you've got a lot of things going on in this particular room. Uh, you've got your study area, coats and cloakroom area. You've also got to be able to eat in here and relax. So it's a multifunction room and they tend to be real clutter collectors. So I've got some great ideas. We've already been and got a few organisational things from the shops. An organisation is the, definitely the key for this room, just to stay in control of that clutter and to make sure that nothing starts getting out of control again. Here we are ready for the decluttering process, but in order to do that, we need to get our three different coloured bags. So do you remember the bags from last time, Larissa? I do remember. They were very important for the whole process of the decluttering last time, you know, in my bedroom. That's right. And the reason that we have three different coloured bags is so that we can differentiate the items and also where they're going to be going. We've got the grey bag, which is for rubbish, rubbish. We've got the green bag, which is for donating. And we've got the blue bag, for recycling, so, and then we're good to go. Let's go. Larissa, here we are. Look at this. This is a what? It's a study area? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think what? it was a study area and it became a messy area. No. Exactly. Kaboom. Yeah. Okay, so let's start, shall we? Um, I'm going to actually go down here yes. because I can see a few bits already that have just managed to accumulate. How about things like this? Okay, these yeah. definitely are items that don't belong in the study area. Exactly. Right. So already we need to just remove these and put these in the places that they should be. There we go, okay. So what have we got going on down here? Okay, these I can maybe use this. Place. Maybe use yeah. that one again, but yeah. yeah, definitely. And we can pop that in the recycling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can put in the bin. Yeah. For donating? Yeah, exactly. I get the... the uh, Donations. What's this, I wonder? I don't know. <laughs> and let's keep these. Oh, it's, it's instructions. My yeah, instructions. Oh, it's instructions. Yeah. Okay, well, again, we can probably find a filing system where you can put all the things like your guarantees and also any instructions they can all go in one particular file so you'll so you won't have to look everywhere to find them next time so perhaps that goes into the recycling blue bag 
What's that that you've got there then? It's a certificate, uh, my husband's certificate. Oh, okay. So we definitely want to keep that, don't we? And this book as well. Yeah. And look at this. This is definitely a very common sight that I find in people's homes. Lots and lots of cables all bundled together. So any other cables I can see, I'm just going to collate those all together and then we can go through them, check which ones you actually really need and then we can actually get rid of the rest. So let's just put those to one side for the moment. Already this area is looking clutter free. So let's come up on top of the desk. So this one. I like to put in my desk because as I am a filmmaker, I like to, to have things that connect with my uh, profession. Sure, okay, so let's pop that to one side as well and we're gonna find a place for that in your new improved uh, study area. Okay, a little bit of paper here. I was considering putting a, a pin board actually up here so that when you've got vouchers and things that might possibly go out of date, if they're in sight, you're not going to forget them. Great. A music section. What kind of musical instruments this one is? Yeah, we have a record player, some CDs, uh, my husband's guitar. Straight away, I want to move this and find a different place for it. So we can move that out of the way. And right. then let's start decluttering all these papers and things like that again. Not an uncommon sight in any household that I've been to is this. As you can see, hallways and places where coats are hung always get quite cluttered, particularly when you've got all of your seasonal outfits out. We've got a mixture of winter clothes, summer clothes. We need to find places for those cycling helmets. We need to find places for scarves. And we need to also differentiate which item is with which person and also give everything a place of its own. So shall we start? Great, let's go. So whose is this? It's mine. Oh, oh yeah, I use you... this coffee every day and uh, in every season. Okay, great. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start again putting things and consolidating them into different, different piles of how often we use things yeah, I use uh, nail every day. Yeah, so yeah. maybe this needs to go back into your wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll pop the things that we're going to move maybe into a different pile yeah. so we yeah. can put them back in the places where they've come from. How about this one? Um, scarf again. Same again. Yeah. And we use this every day? Every day. Right. Okay. That's going to go into the same pile as the last one. And how about this? I use different bags, depends of the day, you know, and the event. The thing to do with bags and scarves and shoes in particular that seem to be quite favourites is to put them all together again. You can then see exactly how many you've got and then make the decision on what you can actually let go of. So we'll pop those in a section down there. What have we got going on? Yeah. But like this, so this again needs to head back into the yeah, wardrobe. Yeah. yeah. My daughter's, yeah, ah, Lara. So we'll pop that in her in her pile, okay? Yeah. And I think that probably is heading back to her room. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This I can assure you, most of the homes that I go to have lots of cycling helmets, which is great. Obviously everybody out there cycling, but they are a bit of a nightmare to store and find a place for. Um, so can we just double check that these ones are definitely still in use? and particularly with children, just be careful when they've grown out of their helmets not that you don't keep adding to the pile of more and more of them. Yeah, 
This, again, is quite a common thing. Everyone forgets that they've got these bags, so then they get more and more and more, more and more. So the best thing is that we're going to put them all together and that you always remember to take them with you. Wow, what a challenge we've had this time. And we've done it. We've transformed Larissa's living room into a really calm space, not just decluttering our way through the living room, but we've also been adding some organization and brilliant ideas about how we could utilize the walls in this particular room. So for example, we've put the pin board into the study area, over door hooks, and also making sure that we've used some boxes and some filing systems that are really going to keep that clutter in control. So let's get Larissa back in and see what she thinks to my final touches of the room. Larissa, are you there? Ah, Hello! Wow. <laughs> Surprise! Oh, I already feel very relaxed just to come in. <laughs> fresh, yeah. you know, fresh air, space. Uh, can see my office again. Because... My goodness! <laughs> Hello! You actually had a desk. <laughs> I have a desk to work and the music session, so beautiful. Yeah. Taking things up the wall and utilising the space to its maximum is going to give you more space in general yeah. and keep you in control of your clutter. Great idea because it, we I used to just throw the helmet there because it didn't have space. And as you can see, yeah, we've got a lower space. peg yeah. Yeah. and also got a basket uh, there. Yeah, so they're very nice. Yeah. So I talked to you about how to to store scarves and things. Well, rolling is definitely a really great way of um, being able to see what you've got and also maximise on space. And I've added all your woolly winter hats because sadly it's getting to that time, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And the table, amazing. Yeah, so what's great about this particular table is that it has got uh, the two lapels on either side, so you can adjust it. You've got enough room there. And then if you have guests or you want to have a bit more space, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You're so yeah, welcome. So I thought you did. I can breathe now, <laughs> yay. That's it for today. Great, can't wait to come back. And so we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to Sally there. Great job as usual. So after the break, we go to our psychologist, Dr. Audrey Tang, with tips on how to help someone who's depressed. And we have our workout of the week with fitness expert, Natalia Katowska. together because the dance actually shows the fight against depression so as you know you've got some punching moves in there you've got that that's you know throwing throwing out anything that's negative so when you're actually doing the dance just remember that the reason behind it is it's like you saying I don't accept to be put down by any kind of problem and I'm gonna fight back we think it's a really really important thing for them to be aware of being um, mentally and emotionally well as well as succeeding with their 
academic success. So when we heard about this dance, we just thought it was amazing. We like to encourage students to open up if they are going through any problem and, and let them know that it's okay to, to talk, that it's okay. if you're going through a problem, it's not nothing to be ashamed of. Waving the flags, I think it's like saying to your worries, go away and don't come back. I found the dance, I thought everybody enjoyed it because it could represent our big and small feelings. Stop, stop, stop! Stop, 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 step back and point away! Step and crash! Step and crash! Step and crash! Do you think this challenge is so important? I think it's very important because it's a very interactive way for young people to take part and know the stigma around mental health and actually make a change. Um, it was really energetic and everyone took part in it and really got in there. I think it's more important because of the actual mental health, not like going on the telly, like the mental health part because it's quite important. Like if you just ignore it, then a lot of bad things could happen. I think it's really important in our school we do take it seriously. Our children are really young, but obviously we want to talk to them about feelings and to recognise the different feelings that they have. to present you with our official Chrissy B Show Participative Certificate. Thank you very much. Well done. Welcome back to today's Chrissy B Show, everybody. Now it's time to head over to Dr. Audrey Tang in this week's Psychology Matters segment, and she's discussing helping someone with depression. Hello, I'm Dr. Audrey from The Chrissy B Show, and this week's Psychology Matters topic is depression and how we can support others. The first thing we need to do is recognize patterns. Patterns of behavior can tell us a lot about what somebody's going through. For example, if an outgoing family member or child has been really excited and really happy, then suddenly changes, becomes very withdrawn, they take less care over their personal care, they are dressing differently, perhaps they're trying to hide, maybe they're speaking in all or nothing sentences. For example, everybody hates me or all my friends think this or that. That can be indicative of them feeling that they are they're experiencing extremes of emotion. If you can recognize these patterns and keep a record, perhaps a journal, then there may be something for you to talk to that person about or perhaps to seek help over. When it comes to seeking help for depression, the diagnosis is often you must be showing at least three to five, it depends on what um, the classification requires, symptoms over a period of six months, usually affecting your daily life. And those things can't be attributed to any other cause. So for example, apathy and being withdrawn may well be one of those symptoms but it might be that you're feeling tired because your iron's low so make sure that there aren't any physical causes or other illnesses that could be presenting in the way that depressive symptoms turn up as well it's then up to you with regards to the treatment that you have if you are prescribed pharmaceuticals do think very carefully advise children, advise family members to think carefully. Some people, they really benefit from the regulation of their neural networks, the regulation of the physiological symptoms before talking therapy helps. But there are many options out there and pharmaceuticals are just one of those. Do what works for you. If you're trying to support somebody, then the best thing you can do is be there for them. Ways that you can help if somebody opens up to you. First of all, realize that they may not want to open up to you, so it doesn't hurt to be able to signpost them to somebody or a website, for example, Childline or the Samaritans, that can help them. 
But if someone does talk to you, listen without judgment. One of the most important things is to hold their anxiety by validating what they say. If they say something such as, oh, I'm so unsuccessful, I'm so ugly, or things that are very negative about themselves, even if you do not see it, hold that thought for that moment. Say something like, I'm sorry you feel that way, before you try and say to them, oh, that's not true, think of all the positives, because unless you validate them, they won't necessarily be able to trust you, because validation is one of the most important things you have to show that they've been heard. The final things to talk about will be preventative measures. Some of these things can include not spending as much time on social media. Spend time in real life with people who energize you, with people you care about. Do things together as a family. Build up those positive experiences. Also, if you need to express yourself, perhaps keep a journal. Being reflective on how you feel, how you think, can also help you recognize patterns and recognize triggers. Other things are, remember that you need to think about your own physical well-being. If we aren't physically healthy, that can affect us mentally as well. So make sure you do all of those things that are good for your body. And remember, when it comes to depression, sadly it is an illness, but it is not part of you. It is something that you can manage and even fight and win. Thank you very much to Dr. Audrey Tang. So now it's time for our workout of the week with Natalia Katowska. Hey guys, it's me, your fitness instructor, Natalia Katowska and Katie Wood with Nat. And today I'll present you full body workout with the mat. So stay with me. But before you start to do any exercises with us, please make sure you contact your doctor and specialist to exactly know what you can or cannot do. So first exercise, we're gonna go to nice, lovely, tall, long plank, and then we're gonna jump open our hands, open our chest, stay in that position. Plank to your squat. Plank, squat. Go for 10 of those, one and two. And you keep counting 10 times. This is your first one. Second one, we're gonna lie on the mat, flat. You're gonna go for exercise called the Spider-Man. We're gonna go all the way up, squeeze everything on top, and down, breathe. Rest for one second. Up, two seconds, one, two, second on the floor. And up, one, two, second on the floor. Again, you're gonna repeat that at least 10 times. And the very last one, long plank on your toes. Touch your shoulders. Now, what I want you to focus on is your hips. Make sure your hips are as square as possible. Belly button in, body weight on your shoulders, chest forward. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you can, go for ten or even more, twenty. Those are your three exercises for today. Thank you for working out with us and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much to Natalia there. So after the break, we look into autism and sleep with our correspondent, Anna Kennedy, and her guests, Dr. Dagmara and Cos Michael. Hi, I'm Chrissy B, host of the UK's only TV programme dedicated to mental health and well-being, The Chrissy B Show, which airs on MyTV Sky 191 every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Follow our social media on YouTube, Instagram and Twitter at Chrissy B Show and our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. For more information, visit chrissybshow.tv. people to think they have to learn to live with depression. I know there's a permanent cure 
and I know sometimes many people hear that you know you can manage depression or learn to live with it and that's something that I totally disagree with because depression is such a horrible thing to to experience and to live with on a day-to-day -day basis because I've been there and I know but I also know that there is a solution a permanent solution. Depression has always been something people say it's incurable once you get depressed you'll never be free of it but it's not true you don't have to manage it you can get rid of it and that's why it's payback time. Obviously I'm taking uh, a couple of these books today uh, to sign copies in order to to give it to some uh, relatives of mine. I know that this book will progress yeah it's about time it's about time it steals too much time for people's lives yeah it's about time. Welcome back to today's Chrissy B Show, everybody. So now it's time to delve into autism and sleep with our autism news correspondent, Anna Kennedy, and her guests, Dr. Dagmara and Cos Michael. Hello, this is Anna Kennedy, and we're talking all things autism. My guests today are Dr. Dagmara Dimitriou and Cos Michael. Hello. So over to Dr. Dagmara. She's a director of the Lifespan Learning and Sleep Lab at the University College London. She has published over 50 articles on sleep and related issues across different developmental disorders. Her current work focuses on sleep-related experience by autistic individuals across the lifespan. Cos Michael is an autism consultant and trainer specializing in adulthood and aging diagnosed as autistic 50 years old cause offers talks and training tailored to the needs of the professionals who come in contact with adults on the autism spectrum covering a range of issues so ladies we're going to be talking about autism and sleep and as you know that's just something that I crave and I don't get a lot of it so Dagmara why do we need sleep? What's so important about sleep? Why can't we survive without sleep? So sleep is absolutely vital for us. It's not only for our health, but there's so much evidence coming out from our research groups that sleep is important for our memories, for learning, but also for daily functioning. We cannot function well without good quality and quantity of sleep. So what's the recommended allowance or is it just different for everybody? So usually one would say that for, for young children they should have optimal number of hours which mm -hmm. is 10 hours. For adults we would recommend at least six hours but quality and quantity of sleep are very very important equally. How about you Cos? Do you get a lot of sleep? <laughs> no I don't. I didn't when I was a child and I don't now. I've never slept uh, through the night properly mm -hmm. uh, in the way that, that one would expect in the general population. So does it have an impact on your day-to-day -day living? Mm -hmm. Yes of course it does. I get tired like anybody else. Um, it means that your brain isn't as active as it should be. Uh, you get physically tired. The concentration is poor and of course as you get older you worry about the impact that that might be having um, in the long term because there is, there is research available now that says there's a link between poor sleep and dementia and then closer you get to old age the more worrying that can be. Yeah I've been reading about that and I was just like it worries me because I worry about my son Angelo because he only gets two to three hours a night and I'm thinking because obviously he's got minimal verbal skills he's profoundly affected and I'm thinking how does that impact on his health but he always seems to have lots of energy and you know he, he keeps going so but it, I know it impacts on me um, you know I can cope day to day and then all of a sudden I might come down with something and it just really affects my health or I get a really bad headache so, um, so is there any up-to-date research that's happening? So what we are trying to do is to look at sleep in a more holistic way. Mm -hmm. So it's not only at the individual, but also at the family. If it, if it is a child, autistic child, we would also look at the parents, at the mm -hmm. siblings. Equally, they, they may get negatively effect, affected by poor sleep. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we would look at adults. Autistic adults need also a lot of care and individualized management of a sleep. Okay, so is there any tips and advice cause that you could give? Um, and have you heard some any stories that might be going out there that you think we get we get told by doctors to practice normal sleep hygiene, which means that you have 
dark curtains, dark room, no television, no blue light, etc. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you've had poor sleep all of your life, you've already done all of that. Mm -hmm. So there is, there are no tips because each of us has a different reason. Mm -hmm. With autistic people who sleep poorly, um, as many th as there are autistic people sleeping poorly, there are reasons why and there are different sleep patterns. So normally poor sleep is supposed to be an abnormality, mm -hmm. but for people for whom it's the daily, nightly experience, mm -hmm. of course, the research doesn't cover it. The, the normal um, information is, is pointless. What do you think about medication? Because um, I've been at desperate stages where, you know, Angela's gone 24 hours a night and I've been to the GP and I said, oh, is there anything that you can prescribe, you know, in the short term that you can at least get some sleep? So th there's various medications out there, but I am worried about, and I have tried them, but they just didn't work anyway. So what do you think about that? So the most important thing is for any medication to be prescribed by professional, by medical professional, either GP or pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, where if it is prescribed, it has to be monitored. Mm -hmm. It cannot just be prescribed in long terms because very often it would stop working. And coming back to, to the uh, sleep hygiene, individuals, autistic individuals very often have different issues, whether they are sensory or behavioral in other ways, that has to be tailored towards them. Mm -hmm. When we talk about sleep hygiene, it's very much driven by notion of being typical population and typical environment and very often it is not therefore it's not going to work and what we have seen in our research parents are frustrated because they cannot follow the sleep hygiene and it is very much double negative so the child is not going to follow that because has different issues and what we have also uh, recently gathered that there are many individuals autistic individuals teenagers adults who are working towards their own sleep and they manage that okay. pretty well but very very different to what we would usually say according to sleep hygiene yeah my eldest son uses a, a fan at night because he said it blocks out the noise and so, sometimes angelo can get a little bit overexcited so mm -hmm. he might squeal or jump so he says it, it blanks out the noise for him because he said if not he can't cope in not doing his job mm -hmm. at work have you ever tried anything There's something that yes. might have helped yes I, i've been right across the pharmacy shelf and uh, <laughs> in the chemist and none of the alternative medicines work. Um, I've tried a fan but for me the noise of a fan actually keeps me awake. Yeah me too. <laughs> However I, I find talking radio, radio for world service, things like that on very very quietly mm -hmm. can help. Doesn't always but can help. Mm -hmm. But as I say it, it's different for everyone and if you want the radio on most digital radios now have a blue light shining mm -hmm. and that's terrible for sleep. So on the one hand the sound may help but the light is a problem. Um, but other, other people would find that that wouldn't help them at all. I think the thing is you need to try various different things and if they're non-invasive and you know they're safe to use it's worth trying because everyone is so different you know there are what do you think about weighted blankets and that sort of thing because I don't find that they're useful but I think it's something again you've got to try. It's probably very much individual mm -hmm. um, there are a number of people who are responding to them very well oh, okay. and they 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 make them fall asleep. Mm -hmm. There are others who will have absolutely no difference. So uh, as we discussed already, it is very much driven by individual and also the family. The family settings, the environment matters for people. Mm -hmm. And taking away a lot of uh, comforts that give individuals, autistic individuals, would actually provide very negative uh, effect and for example when we are talking about um, environment very often we hear uh, that children should have very very bare minimum in their room yeah we have not seen that um, we have visited over 80 um, individuals teenagers okay. and autistic teenagers and their rooms are absolutely full of different things which actually comfort them yeah. they give them security mm -hmm. and there's another important part for parents to consider whether school environment is not 
providing negative effects in terms of anxieties. A lot of teenagers across the board, they have anxieties. And if they are bringing anxieties home, mm -hmm. that will trigger poor sleep. I've spoken to many parents where their you know, children might be working towards GCSEs, mm. so the anxieties are building, homework. Um, some um, of the teenagers saying, why do we have to do homework? You know, we've been to school, we shouldn't have to bring it home. So there's, there's all those different issues that, you know, and what friends might have said, they're overanalyzing what they've said to them during the yeah. day. Because my son used to do that all the time, because he used to say, well, what did they mean when they said that? What did, and then he'd keep going over it and over it. So there's all those different things to take into consideration as well. What, what, how was it for you when you were younger, if you don't mind me asking? It, it was exactly the same. I mean, it, I, I find that physical exercise obviously tires you physically, mm -hmm. but to stop the mind running on and on and on about everything that happened during the day, mm -hmm. um, I, I think anything that, that can help reduce anxiety, mm -hmm. like for instance, telling people, yes, you may get anxious, but it will pass. Mm -hmm. That will help okay. for some people. Just knowing that it will pass will help it pass, I found, mm. um, as a youngster, because I used to get anxiety attacks. Mm. And every time I did, I thought I was going to die, you yeah. know. So, so that sort of thing can help. But it was always bad. And it, 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 to, to talk about it as, as young and then as older, it's just a continuum. Um, the same things then as now mm -hmm. affect sleep. Okay. So. so what do you think the answer is going to be then for us all to get a good night's sleep? Do you think there's one answer? I don't think there is because I've been trying for 26 years. <laughs> I don't think there is, but I do think it's very important for parents and also autistic adults throughout their the lifespan that we have to manage the sleep in very flexible manner. Mm -hmm. There's no answer for every single person in one way and trying different ways um, in terms of changing environments for parents also not to feel guilty. That's very important. Do. Don't feel guilty if you cannot follow certain rules or what professionals say. Mm -hmm. Important part is to understand what makes a child feeling secure and lowering anxieties, as Cos has mentioned. Anxieties, how we can manage them. The, if we have an answer for that, okay. I think we'll manage our sleep. So if people are interested in looking at the website on some of the results of the research that you've put out there, would they look at the sleep lab at the University College London? Would they find it? Thank you, Dagmara. Thank you, Cos. And now it's over to Chrissy. So after the break, nutritionist Severine Menem gives advice for diabetes and Dr. Rob Hicks gives tips to help if you have tennis elbow. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay not okay. I teach people to see depression as an enemy, not as a friend. I'm always going to be speaking about how you can actually kick depression out of your life and I give tips in the book of what you can do, how you can start to see depression so that you can get rid of it for good. Miss Chris, you've done a good job and you didn't want to keep this help to yourself. You decided to share with everybody. You wrote a book which gives access to anyone who wants to improve she was able to get out of depression. Now she will be able with the book to get um, not only in the UK but around the world. Because it's time to reveal to the world the truth. If you know anyone who is suffering from depression, then this book is highly recommended. Welcome back to today's Chrissy B Show, everybody. So now it's time to head over to Dr. Rob Hicks talking about tennis elbow. Hello and welcome to Doctor's Orders here on the Chrissy B Show. I'm Dr. Rob Hicks. Today I'm going to be talking with you about the problem of tennis elbow. This is a very common problem that causes pain around the elbow and not just pain but also makes it sometimes difficult for people to move and use their arm properly. What happens in tennis elbow or what causes it 
is it's essentially repetitive actions cause tiny tears and inflammation to occur in the muscles and the tendons of the elbow joint. Now although the name is tennis elbow, you don't have to be a tennis player to get this condition, although it is relatively common in tennis players. Any repetitive activity that puts strain on these muscles and tendons can trigger tennis elbow. So decorating, for example, or playing a musical instrument like a violin can also be responsible. Now tennis elbow is actually really very common. It's estimated that here in the UK, up to one in three people have the condition at any point in time. Uh, men and women are equally affected and it tends to affect people most often uh, in middle age. Now the symptoms that tennis elbow causes are primarily pain on the outside of the elbow. Interestingly enough, when the pain occurs on the inside of the elbow, it's known as golfer's elbow, but that's a different condition, a similar but different condition. So you get this pain on the outside of the elbow and also it may feel painful when you bend your arm or try and lift your arm or when you are gripping a small object like a pen for example you'll experience the pain on the outside of the elbow or if you're trying to do an action like opening a door turning a doorknob or trying to remove a, a, a lid off a jar that sort of movement uh, can cause pain as well so you can see how this pain impacts on everyday activities really Another symptom that people often complain about is that they find it difficult to extend or, or straighten their arm. So you can see again, because of that and the pain, it can make it difficult to do everyday things. But the good news is, this is a condition that generally gets better on its own without the need for treatment. It normally takes somewhere between six months and two years to get better. That said, for 90% of people, who have tennis elbow, they're fully recovered within a year. Now, although I said that this is a condition that gets better without treatment, there are treatments available, and these are beneficial. Not only will they help relieve the symptoms, but also they can speed up the recovery time. So rest of the elbow joint is important, and so is stopping any activity that you know causes the pain because actually if you keep doing that activity you're likely to make matters worse and slow your recovery time. Then of course there's cold compresses, a bag of frozen peas wrapped in a tea towel for example placed on the elbow can help calm down the pain and inflammation as can painkillers and sometimes physiotherapy is recommended as well to help improve the function of the joint and the strength of the muscles and to ease some of the pain. Rarely surgery is needed and that's to remove the damaged part of the tendon but generally speaking that's only as a very last resort because when other, other treatments haven't helped enough. But generally speaking the vast majority of people will recover through the simple measures and won't need surgical intervention. So as you can see there are lots of things that you can do uh, to be helping that elbow recover, that tennis elbow recover. And whether you've got tennis elbow or not, there are things you can do to improve the strength and the functionality of your elbow joint. So avoid doing lots of repetitive straining activities on the, that affect the elbow joint. And also keep the forearm muscles strong, because we know that strong, fit muscles are less likely to get damaged. So look after your elbow and your forearm, and they'll look after you. And that's doctor's orders. Time to go back to you, Christy. Thank you very much to Dr. Rob Hicks. Now it's time to go to Severin Menem, our nutritionist, talking about diabetes prevention. Hi, my name is Severin Menem and I'm a nutritionist. Today I'm going to discuss about diabetes. Diabetes is a serious condition. In the UK, it is estimated that about 4 million people are suffering from this condition. Three and, a, three and a half million are actually diagnosed and about half a million are not diagnosed yet. And it is progressing. 
It is also estimated that within five years, another million people would possibly get diabetes. So there are actually two types of diabetes. There is a type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune condition where the cells of the pancreas are being destroyed and cannot produce insulin, uh, which makes up 10% of the people diagnosed with diabetes. And 90% of the people have type 2 diabetes, which is actually a lifestyle condition. And that's where um, the discussion about today would be a lot more helpful. If left untreated, um, and by untreated I mean if you don't take the proper medication, diabetes can have some serious effects. The first one is it affects our blood vessels. And by affecting our blood vessels, what I mean is it prevents the blood from flowing all around our body, which means that you can have high blood pressure, strokes, cardiovascular disease, and so on. It also affects our nerves. What does it mean concretely in terms of symptoms? You would get your, the top of your finger and your toes tingling, uh, and then uh, coming up, up to the point where you wouldn't feel anything. And again, that's because the blood circulation is not flowing properly. Diabetes can also affect the kidney, uh, triggering potentially um, dialysis and up to kidney failure. But also, if you have uh, some uh, wounds, the healing would be slowed down because the blood can't reach the um, the wound and then leaving the skin uh, more up to get infections. Um, there are a lot more conditions that could be triggered by uh, diabetes. Um, this includes sleep apnea and Alzheimer's. The good news is there is a lot you can do about type 2 diabetes and it all includes um, lifestyle changes, dietary lifestyle actually. The first thing would be to check what you're eating, to cut all sugar and ideally all processed foods. If you eat food and um, if you start cooking food from scratch, there is hardly anything that you get, can get wrong there. The good thing when you start changing what you're eating is you're more likely to lose weight. And weight management is one of the big things of diabetes. People who have diabetes tend to put on weight or retain the weight. But when you change what you eat, it's more than likely that you're going to lose weight. And what goes with weight loss uh, in terms of what you eat is movement. It is very important that you move, move as much as you can, especially if you have a sedentary work. So that you know, every, you put the timer and every, I don't know, 40 to 50 minutes, you stand up, go to the kitchen, go to the toilet, but you move. If you don't like to exercise, at least try to do your 10,000 steps a day. Or if you like to exercise, any type of exercise is good, whether it's cardiovascular or uh, strength training. So these were my recommendations to help with diabetes. It is very important that you are aware that this is a serious condition and you do whatever it takes to help manage it the best you can. It is also very important that you know that a lot of people can uh, put diabetes into remission if you change your diet and your lifestyle. Thank you very much to Severine and also to all our guests on today's programme. What I'd like to uh, talk about today is actually following on from what Anna and her guests were talking about regarding sleep. So as we heard from the experts there, you know, it differs for everybody why certain people can't sleep. But I know what it's like not to be able to sleep very well and in the past the reason I couldn't sleep well because I was actually afraid of the dark, I was afraid of having panic attacks and I just didn't like night time in general. I didn't like to be on my own, it was just a really really hard time so that's what used to keep me awake. I used to watch TV until very late um, and back then we didn't really have social media as such so I had sleeping problems because of the problems that I was going through. 
So it's very important that if you aren't sleeping well and you've followed all the sleep hygiene um, advice out there, and we have spoken about it several times on this program before, if it's still not working, then you need to kind of think, what could it be? Is there something that's worrying you? Is there an unresolved matter, for example? Is it something that, uh, an issue that you've had with a loved one or a work colleague, something that's worrying you at work? Identify what that thing is because that, you might not think it's that thing that's kind of keeping you up, but if you are mulling over in your mind, then it's likely that it is affecting your sleep. And no matter, you know, if you put into practice all the hygiene techniques and stuff, sleep hygiene techniques, it still probably won't make a difference if you have something that's unresolved. And the best way to get over these things is to actually go and approach people and resolve any issues that you might be going through, or at least try. And sometimes just the, the kind of thought of, of going and solving an issue can already kind of make you calmer. Something else that maybe keeps you up, something that sometimes keeps me up, it's not that I'm worried about these things, but if I have a lot of things to do and, I, and I'm, I'm thinking about lots of stuff, Sometimes when I'm trying to sleep, when it's nice and quiet, already in my mind I'm kind of mulling over, okay, well, first I can do this, and then I can do that, and then I can sort this out. And I'm just trying to kind of organize things in my head. So when I find myself doing that, and it's actually stopping me from, from sleeping, then I will just write it all down. So I know, okay, I, I, can't, I don't want to forget this, so I'll get up and, or on my phone, and I'll, I'll write it, I'll, I'll make notes, or send myself an email. I love to do that, sending myself emails. <laughs> and then I'll put it in my diary the next day. So at least it's sort of out of my head and onto paper or onto my phone where I'm not gonna forget. So once I know that it's, it's going to be dealt with and I'm not gonna forget because I've actually noted it somewhere, then I'm fine after that. But if, you know, if, you, you can try this. It, it works for me anyway, because sometimes it's not that you are going through any particular problem necessarily, or that you know you have unresolved issues with people. It could simply be that you have a lot to do and you're just trying to kind of think of the best way to get things done. So that's a trick that I apply. Well, everyone, we have reached the end of today's programme, but if you have a story that you would like to share, please do get in touch with us by emailing info at chrissybshow.tv. You can also tweet or Instagram us at Chrissy B Show or leave a message on our Facebook page, The Chrissy B Show. And if you'd like to know more about my mental health journey, please visit my personal website, which is mylifeafterdepression.com. Until next time, bye for now.